Okay, I'm going to go ahead and talk about eukaryotic cell structure and function. Um, let's quickly review. The cell theory states that all living things are made of cells, um, that a cell, cells are the smallest units of life. That means they're the smallest thing that can do all seven characteristics of life that we discussed. And they also come from other cells. So a cell comes from a cell, comes from a cell, comes from a cell, over and over and over again. And the definition of a cell is the smallest unit that is capable of performing all characteristics of life. That's all seven that we talked about. So these are some examples. Some of you guys started to see some of these under the microscope recently. And we have the amoeba, there's a plant stem, there's some bacteria, a red blood cell, a nerve cell. These are the kinds that are in your brain. And as you remember, there are two types of cell. We have the prokaryotic cells and the eukaryotic cells. So prokaryotic, just as a review, does not have any structures bound by membranes. So there's nothing, no little sacs in here, no little organs that um, help this cell survive. Um, so there are very few internal structures. There's definitely no nucleus or no brain of the cell. And usually these are single-celled, well actually always these are single-celled organisms. So unicellular organisms. A eukaryotic cell. These are the ones that do contain organelles or small organs. They do have a nucleus or a brain. Um, I say brain because that is, in quotes, what it's essentially responsible for is the function of the cell. Um, and it can either be a plant cell or it can be an animal cell. So your typical plant cell looks like this. Okay, there's lots of little squigglies and foreign objects that you're probably not used to seeing, but um, we'll go over them, like the mitochondrion, the Golgi apparatus, the nucleolus, the nucleus, and I know that there are a ton of really long words here. We're going to keep working on these um, so that you can really get a good handle on it. And here's the typical plant cell. So if you look at between these two, I'd like you really quickly in your interactive notebook to just jot down a few thoughts. How are they alike? How are they different? Okay, just a few thoughts. Go ahead and pause. Maybe 20 seconds. Take 20 seconds to write down what is the difference or what do you notice is different between a typical animal cell and a typical plant cell. Okay, so now that you've done that, hopefully you've noticed that there is something that's very large in the plant cell and that the plant cell has kind of two boundaries, um, which we'll talk about in a second. And this thing in the middle is actually not the nucleus, it's something called a vacuole, which we'll talk about in a second as well. All right, so cell parts, animals and plant organelles. So the function, so the following organelles have this function. They are a boundary between the outside world and the cell. So the plasma membrane, which you guys watched a video on recently, Okay, is the flexible boundary of a cell that separates a cell from its surroundings. It usually regulates what goes in and out of the cell and therefore protects the cell from anything that would be bad from it getting in. It's made of a double layer of phospholipids. Remember that's the uh, phosphate head with the lipid tail and that's called a phospholipid bilayer. There is the cell wall. Now cell walls only happen in plant cells and some bacteria and this is a rigid wall made of um, protein that gives extra support to the cells, gives extra support uh, to the cells and these are found like I said only in plant cells and some bacteria. They're really not found too often in any other eukaryotic cells um, other than plant cells. Alright, so in the next group of organelles, their function is controlling the cell. Controlling the cells, or they're the control center, or part of the control center for the cell. The very first thing is the nucleus. This directs all cells' activities, meaning whatever the cell does, the nucleus has told it to do. Um, and this is the cell's control center, or brain, as I've been calling it. Um, it's separated from the cytoplasm by a nuclear envelope, so it's protected in this nice little envelope, and it holds all the genetic material. All of our DNA is held in the nucleus of every single one of our cells. So as a human, you are made up of billions and billions, if not trillions of cells, and in each of those cells there is a nucleus, and in each of those nuclei, there is DNA, or your genetic material. 
Okay, the nuclear envelope, like I said, surrounds, it's just like the membrane, the plasma membrane that goes around the cell. This membrane goes around the nucleus. It's called the nuclear envelope. Um, it has openings. These are called nuclear pores or nuclear holes, um, and they allow material to enter and leave the nucleus. It's very selective, though, about what gets in there because, remember, your DNA is in there, and your cell wants to protect your DNA from anything that might be bad. Okay, DNA. You'll see DNA in your nucleus in one of two ways. It'll either be in the chromatin form. If it's in the chromatin form, you may not actually see it because it's not condensed, meaning it's pretty thin. It's like spaghetti. Um, it's really super thin, almost like hairs, okay, that you can barely see unless you take a bunch of them and twist them together, and then you've got a nice chunk and you can definitely see it. When you do that and you take a bunch of it and you twist it together, it becomes chromosomes or condensed chromatin. Um, and this is all your genes, guys. Your genes is held in chromatin and chromosomes in your cell. Chromosomes, they only thicken when the cell is ready to divide. So when the cell is ready to go from being one cell to being two smaller cells. And we'll talk more about that in a little while. Okay, the nucleolus. So the nuclear membrane is outside the nucleus, and then within the nucleus there's this area called the nucleolus. It's essentially the center of the nucleus, and um, it is where ribosomes are made, and we'll talk about what ribosomes do in a second, but they're very important. So your ribosomes are made in the nucleolus. So if this is our nucleus, you see we have our nuclear envelope, and each of these dashed lines are the nuclear pores that allow things, some things, in and out of the nucleus. All this squiggliness is our chromatin, and in the center we have our nucleolus, which is where our ribosomes are made. Ribosomes. So ribosomes are where proteins get made, and they get made according to DNA's directions. So DNA is essentially the directions of how to be you, or how the cell is going to function. And so these DNA give instructions to the ribosomes of what proteins to make. And proteins direct what the cell does. So if DNA tells the ribosomes to make certain proteins, then those proteins can be used for some sort of job within the cell. Um, and the ribosomes can either be bound, meaning um, implanted on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. It's called rough because there are ribosomes on it. Or free floating in the cytoplasm, so just kind of around. The cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is essentially thick, fluid, jelly-like substance that goes throughout the cell. Um, it is surrounded by the cell membrane to keep all the cytoplasm in, and it, hold things, it holds things gently in place so that um, it doesn't kind of deflate. Okay, so the next uh, function set of organelles have this function. They have the function um, to assemble or make things, transport things, and store things. So the endoplasmic reticulum, as we said, is um, the site where lipids and proteins are made for the cell membrane. So if you remember the plasma membrane, plasma membrane and cell membrane are the same thing. Um, as you remember last night, there are proteins and carbohydrates and lipids that all live within the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. And so those lipids and proteins and carbohydrates are created in the endoplasmic reticulum. I said there are two types. There's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, which has ribosomes all over it. Okay, And this is where proteins are made, because ribosomes make proteins, so endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins. Okay, Rough endoplasmic reticulum makes proteins, because it has ribosomes. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum does not have ribosomes, and it produces lipids, or fats. The Golgi body or Golgi apparatus, this moves materials within the cell. So this is essentially like the post office of the cell. 
So it allows things to get packed up, organized, and shipped off to wherever they go in the cell. And sometimes it actually moves material out of the cell. So it either moves material around the cell or it moves material out of the cell. It sorts and packages proteins and materials into structured called vesicles. These are like little storage or shipment containers. And those things are shipped out or around the cell. Um, we'll talk more about what that looks like later. Lysosomes. Lysosomes is the digestive plant um, for proteins, fats, and carbohydrates. So essentially this is the stomach. So this is the cell's stomach or garbage dump. Um, this, now this has digestive juices in it, um, which if the lysosome were to break, that, that would just burst apart and you'd be in big trouble. Uh, the vacuole. The vacuole is the membrane-bound sac for storage, digestion, and waste removal. So essentially this is where we store things. It's usually pretty big in plants and a lot. there's several small vacuoles in animal cells. And the reason it's so big in plants is because the vacuole in plants help maintain its shape. Most plants have large central vacuoles that sit in the center of the cell and that's how they help maintain the shape. Mitochondria. These transform chemical energy from food into useful energy for both plant and animal cells. This is the site of cellular respiration. So when you eat, you eat and it breaks down into sugars or carbohydrates. And then the mitochondria takes those carbohydrates and transforms it into an energy that the cell can actually use. Because the cell can't use sugar. Or, or carbohydrates. It has to have it in its own chemical form. And so the mitochondria takes that sugar that you've eaten and it breaks it down into energy that the cell can use. Chloroplasts. Now these are only found in some or in all plant cells and some protists. Um, it captures sunlight and converts or makes chemical energy out of it. It makes so if you know that plants don't eat, right? We eat um, food to get our carbohydrates. Plants can't eat, so they have to make their carbohydrates. They make their carbohydrates from the sunlight's energy, and that sunlight's energy is captured in this thing called a chloroplast, and it is converted into chemical energy that the cell can use. And the pro this process is called photosynthesis, and we'll talk about that more later too. And the final function we're going to talk about is support and locomotion or movement. The cytoskeleton, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a network of protein filaments that help the cell keep its shape, just like our skeleton helps us keep our bodies up so we don't melt into a puddle of jello. The cytoskeleton helps the cells keep its shape, and it's made of proteins. It also helps with movement. And protein filaments called microtubules and microfilaments are a part of this cytoskeleton. Centrioles. Centrioles are a big part of cell division. So when one cell becomes two cells, these centrioles are a big piece of it. And they are made of things called microtubules. And finally, we have the cilia and the flagella. Cilia are short hair-like projections that help cells move. So you see how there's these little tiny hairs off of this cell right here? Those are cilia, and they help cells move by moving water through those little things. They can kind of wave around, almost like little paddles. The flagella is like a long like whip projection that allows us to move. And um, usually cells that have flagella only have one or two of them. And they just swing it around kind of like a propeller blade um, so that they can, excuse me, move forward. Flagella is a lot more common in single-celled organisms, while cilia is a lot more common in multicellular organisms. You can find examples of both flagella and cilia in both single-celled and multicellular organisms. Okay, that's all. I do want to really quick before this video is over, I would like you to walk through and say all of um, and say all of the names of the organelles with me really quick. So after I say them, you say them. Plasma membrane, cell wall, nucleus, nuclear envelope, 
chromatin, chromosomes, nucleolus, ribosomes, cytoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, Golgi apparatus, lysosome, vacuole, mitochondria, chloroplast. All right, we're going to get cut off.